show you the structure of DNA. It's a very famous structure discovered um, 50 years ago or so by Watson and Crick, and they called it a double helix. Now, for those of you who don't know what a double helix is, it's this shape here, and the simplest way to explain it would be if you think about a rope ladder, a ladder you know, going up a tree or something, and you twist that rope ladder, that's rather like what a double helix is here. It has these backbones and it has these rungs. This is a space-filling model. These are actually the atoms of DNA here, modeled uh, using kids' toys. Um, but you can still see these rungs here, and it's the rungs of the ladder that are so important. Each rung is a chemical. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. Uh, and these chemicals have names, and the names begin with four letters, A, C, G, and T. And that is basically the genetic code. You're all good at reading code too. You understand the code that's known as the English language. And you can read the writing on this page and get meaning out of it. What I can do is to read code written in the letters A, C, G, and T and get understanding out of that. But they are not actually letters, they're just the names of these chemicals. And it's the order of these chemicals, the order of these letters, that encodes the information, the information that we're trying to decipher. Now there's one thing I'd like you to try to remember about these four letters. Um, it's that the A letter is always opposite the T letter, and the G always opposite C. So look down here, here we've got an A, what's opposite? A T. Here we've got a C, goes with a G. T goes with an A, and so on and so forth. And actually, you can actually tear the DNA strand apart. And that's how we make new DNA for the next generation. Um, I want you to realize how much DNA we have. It's absolutely huge. Stuffed inside every cell in our body are 6,000 million letters of DNA. Now, none of you really are going to have a good grip of how big that really is. So I've looked it up. Um, if you typed it all out in a standard-sized paperback, how many books do you think you'd need to write 6,000 A's, C's, G's and T's out? Anyone know? 12,000. It would be 12,000 paperbacks. You'd have a library, and that's just my DNA. If we take someone else's, you need another library, and another library, and another library. Another way to think about it is, if these letters were notes in a tune, okay? So it's a very long tune. Uh, and we were to play it very quickly at an allegro tempo, 120 beats per minute, it would take almost a century to play. It's a very big number. But luckily for me, 99.9% .9 of these letters are identical amongst everyone in this room. Um, so what I'm interested in is the 0.1% that differ. But it's important to understand where did that 0.1% come from? Because these are the markers. These are the markers that we use to identify historical lineages. And these are the basis of all genetics, actually. And what happens is that DNA has to be copied, as I alluded to before, in order to make the next generation, to make sperm and to make eggs. So what's happening here is the DNA spirals going into this molecular machine, which is then splitting it apart. Here's the one strand coming out here, the other coming out here. And it builds a new strand against it. Here's the one and the other one you can't see so well going up there. So that you start from one strand and you get two. This is the basis of life. This is generation. This is the process of making new people, new animals, new plants, new anything. This is exactly what's going on. And uh, this machine is very high fidelity. Uh, if I gave you the job of copying six billion letters, you'd make a lot of mistakes. So would I. This machine makes hardly any mistakes, but occasionally it does make a mistake. And instead of putting an A in where it should do, it puts a T in. And this is the origin of all changes in the code, of all markers, of all variants. And there are errors made when copying the DNA for the eggs or the sperm. We refer to them as changes, variants, or markers. And these are inherited. The next stage is to ask, OK, so that's all out there, all out here. How do I know about it? How can I see it? How can I find this? And I already mentioned the first step. You have to spit, and I extract the DNA. I then have to read the letters of the DNA code. Uh, and this was invented by a Nobel laureate called Fred Sanger in 1977, the process of DNA sequencing, to read the sequence of the letters in the code. And this is the output from a DNA sequencer. This is my DNA. This is one person's DNA in the top panel here. And this is my PhD supervisor, David Goldstein's DNA in the bottom panel. And you can read the letters of the code using these fluorescent peaks. Here we go, A, 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 C, A, 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 C, T. And you can see that David and I are almost identical. Remember, everyone's 99.9% .9 identical. But look here, 
I have a C and he has a T. This is a marker. This is a variant. This is where we differ. And this uh, marker shows uh, that David descends from a different lineage from the lineage I descend from. This is the basis of it all. Uh, and this is only one of over 50 million markers that we know in human beings today. There's probably a huge number more out there we haven't discovered. But we don't do Sanger sequencing anymore. Uh, at Scotland's DNA, we've uh, used latest technology, which is known as gene chips. This is a revolutionary step forward that is revolutionising biomedicine, and we're now uh, using it to revolutionise the study of genetic history. It was invented by a couple of companies, principally Illumina uh, in California, and it allows us to read a million or indeed five million markers uh, in one person in one experiment highly accurately. When I did a PhD, it would take me weeks to just read one marker in a few people. And now in three days, you can read thousands of people uh, for millions of markers. It's going to be, well, it already is a data overload. And the way it does this is that we actually create, not me personally, a synthetic DNA, which is matching to one of the two variants. Remember I said the A goes with the T and the C goes with the G? We can make synthetic DNA that's going to match to Alistair's variant or to my variant. And we put all of these uh, onto beads on a little chip. You can see the chip here, a bit like a silicon wafer, and we've zoomed in and zoomed in, you can see all these beads. Each of these beads is interrogating a marker. It's interrogating a piece of DNA that we know is variable, we know it's interesting, and we've put on, uh, let's say, the C or, or the T onto it, and we've attached a different dye to each, a green dye to the one and a red dye to the other. So when that, if you know anything about fluorescence, um, when uh, we put the DNA, we take your DNA and we uh, run it over this chip, the, the little synthetic pieces of DNA find the bits of DNA in your genome and match to them. And when they become double-stranded, when the two strands come together, the dye fluoresces. We see a bright light. We put that through a machine to read it. So I know this is somewhat complicated, but I think some of you wanted to know what was going on. How did we do it? This is how we did it. We make synthetic DNA and then we let it find the match in your DNA. And because we've labeled the synthetic DNA with different colors, we then know whether you're a C or a T, whether you're this marker or that marker. It's quite easy. And what comes out <laughs> is one of these graphs. This is one marker now. And this is just a graph showing how much green light came out from the bead and how much red light came out from the bead. And if you've only got red light, in this instance, you're T. If you've only got green light, in this instance, you're Excuse me, your C. And actually, remember, you, get two copy, you have two copies of your DNA, one from mum and one from dad. So each dot is a person. These guys in the middle got a C from the one parent and a T from the other parent. So what I spend my life doing is staring at loads and loads of these plots, uh, trying to work out who belongs to which group. 